Oh, this four o'clock hour, Tim Brando, Fox Sports, great friend of the show, joins us on Sikkim 365 Radio, David Smoke and Craig Smoke. Paul's out today, back with us tomorrow. We'll be live in Fort Worth as Baylor opens the tournament up there. Tim, thanks for your time. If you don't mind, I'm going to start with a broadcast uh, question. Your thoughts about some of the, the movement when it comes to the NFL with Joe Buck and Troy Aikman to ESPN, and, and it just seemed like things have kind of – it's a little like they free agency there as well. <laughs> yeah, you can say that again. Um, an old uh, mentor of mine and friend – uh, from years gone by that helped mentor me uh, when I got into this business. Kurt Gowdy once said to me as a young aspiring broadcaster at the Final Four in New Orleans in 1982, he said, kid, remember this as you're on your path. The only thing that never changes is change. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of truth to that. Uh, they had a remarkable run of a long period of time at Fox. Uh, but the industry is changing without question. Uh, you know, the digital, you guys, you guys see it, you're living it, uh, you know, from a, um, a local and regional standpoint. And, uh, it's, it's true across the board at every level of broadcasting that the industry's changing. And so, you know, you've got Amazon getting involved and, uh, they procure the executive producer of NBC's NFL Sunday night football, Fred Gadelli, who was, uh, uh, broadcast associate and uh, uh, associate director uh, when I was at ESPN. He's become really the premier producer of, of NFL football. His uh, war chest is filled with Emmys. And uh, he and Al Michaels are close. And so Al has shown the door really because of his age more than anything else. His fastball is still good. Uh, it's not, I think he's handled it with grace because he knew it was coming. Mike Tirico was was hired with this in mind, and Al knew that. And then you have, uh, so you got Amazon really, uh, I think, is, is, is what spawns all of this, is that now there are more ways to broadcast than just, you know, over-the-air, linear commercial television. And for that matter, cable is uh, struggling to find a way to hold on to its, uh, its subscribers as a result. So, you know, the, the industry's changed in every respect. And, uh, you know, without question, uh, ESPN was in need, uh, in desperate need of uh, what they felt was um, uh, a booth that would rival that of, of both CBS and Fox. So what did they do? They, they, they raided Fox's booth and, and found uh, a very accommodating Troy Aikman and, and, and Joe Buck. So uh, good for them. I, I do think that the relationship between – the way broadcast television looks at commentators of live events has changed uh, and not for the better. Um, the, the, the goal I think is to have premier talent for your best games. But I think that after that, it appears that play by play is becoming somewhat of a lost art. We're seeing more and more, uh, people that are under contract to do studio shows, uh, being told, hey, we want you to go do this or that game. And frankly, as you guys know, that's a that's a different art form. Mm-hmm. You know, not everybody, in fact, very few have the ability to do both studio as well as play-by-play. Uh, for a lot of years, I thought the fact that I was uh, a bit more of a studio entity and, uh, and was, uh, fortunately for me, good at it. It certainly served me well. But uh, until I got to Fox, I was not able to do just play by play in my in my career path. You know, I was trying to do a, a combination of both, and uh, and frankly, I think um, for the long haul, it it, it it was good because it kept me uh, vibrant, kept me relevant, and uh, people invisible. You know, people knew who I was because they had seen me as well as were hearing me. Uh, but that's you know, again, only a handful of people can do both, uh, and you know who they are. Uh, starting with Musburger and clearly uh, guys like Nance uh, and uh, Chris Fowler's, I think, made a, a very nice adjustment to, to the booth over time. And But there's not many uh, of us that can do both. And uh, when you start throwing out guys that are doing and anchoring uh, sports center shows and you tell them, okay, go do a ball game, yeah. that's, a, that's, a whole different, uh, that's a whole different thing. No and, and I think to some extent uh, – Play-by-play has suffered somewhat 
in terms of its appreciation by those that are that are in positions to decide who does what. Uh, clearly, it means a lot if you're going to be the number one team, uh, and I think it means a lot if you're in the top tier, maybe the top three or four games uh, that a network might have. But after that, it seems that it's become more and more difficult for young people that want to just do play-by-play to get a break because the jobs are going to people that um, you know clearly haven't uh, done the, uh, in my opinion, the uh, uh, the duty that you, you need to do. You know, due diligence to move up the ladder as play-by-play people to get that that opportunity. But look, uh, as as a business, we all have to adjust and adapt, and, and it's clear that that's going on. And I think that um, with all the rights fees for uh, both you know professional sports as well as college sports coming up, you're likely to see even more movement. There'll probably be even more uh, movement that you haven't even thought about uh, between now and the time Tom meets leather next fall. Tim, you've had an illustrious career and covered uh, you know so many fantastic events over the years. Uh, where does March Madness? Where where is that soft spot in your heart amongst like all the things that you you've done and, and continue to do? Uh, what kind of a place does March Madness have there? Oh, it's way up there. You know, it's way up there. The most exciting and exhilarating time of my career was getting to to do the NCAA tournament and all the way to the regional finals with Al McGuire. Uh, back in the late 90s at CBS. That was a thrill for me. And um, uh, it didn't last long because, uh, speaking of movement, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we got the NFL back at CBS after we had lost it to Fox. And uh, here comes Vern Lundquist back, okay, who had, who had left CBS and had gone to Turner. And here comes Dick Inberg from NBC, whose contract wasn't picked up because this guy named Costas was pretty good. And Dick was in the... Uh, uh, twilight of his career, and and um, Sean McManus, understandably, said, you know, I, I want him. He still got he still got his fastball. So Dick came over, and um, I started doing the Division Two National Championship uh, Elite Eight with uh, CBS the, the, the second weekend after that. Uh, but it was a great run of eighteen years, a lot of buzzer beaters, and and an opportunity to work with some of the all time greats um, like Billy Packer. Uh, Raft and and uh, and Al McGuire and of course now at, at Fox I get to do the same during the regular season. Don't get to work the tournament, but you know I love the sports so much, fellas, that I don't miss it really. I, you know when you're just doing the first weekend, it's such a blur. You know you're preparing for eight teams, four games in one day, and uh, you know when it when it's over. And my last year was gosh nine years ago in 2013. Uh, in Austin. I didn't know it would be. I have an abrupt divorce, as uh, you know. It's been well documented with CBS in 2014 and moved over to Fox. But, uh, you know, I actually now appreciate watching all of the tournament. When I was doing it, you know, I was living in this vacuum with eight teams and four four games, and then the two, uh, you know, semifinals or second round games uh, would be played, the round of, of 32. And then I was done. You know, and then I had to hustle over to the Division Two or the Elite Eight, usually in Springfield, and get ready for teams that I'd never seen before. And so I missed a lot of the tournament. And now I, I really get to enjoy it. Uh, and I'll go to the Final Four. I do the NABC uh, coaches uh, uh, convention. I, I MC a number of their uh, seminars, as well as uh, the Champions Brunch for all of the regular season champions. And and my friend Mike Oresco and I will, uh, and our wives will sit together at the Final Four midcourt, and it's a, it's a wonderful thing. So it's it's the one sport and 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 event that captivates us for three solid weeks, and at the end, I want to be there. Yeah. You know, I don't say that about the World Series. I don't say that about the Super Bowl. I don't say it about uh, any other major sporting event except March Madness and the NCAA tournament. So uh, I'm forever a fan of it. Uh, even though I'm no longer doing it. I hosted it at ESPN in the 80s, and I did play-by-play for CBS in the 90s and all the way through you know, 2013. So a nice 18-year run at one place and, and nine years at another. So I, I got my fill of it, that's for sure. <laughs> Tim, when you're with Mike Oresco, you, would you nudge him and ask him when UCF, Houston, and Cincinnati might be able to leave that conference and it will be earlier than what maybe the – the so-called rules say, because obviously those in the Big 12 interested with that, and who knows what might happen with that. That's that's interesting how quickly that flipped up. Yeah, you know, I think all of the 
uh, all of the movement has been put on hold in large measure, man, because uh, fellas, because of the uh, the playoff yeah, uh, being no put question. aside. You know that, that the whole the whole playoff expansion uh, deal, you know, reaching the fork in the road, and no one was able to get through the fork means means that I think you're going to be watching Oklahoma and Texas playing in the in the Big 12 for another two years. I really believe that. They, yeah. It could happen it could happen that they would leave and miss that third year, you know, when there's only one year left because the buyout would not be as you know as costly as it currently is. And uh, I don't think it's that important necessarily to Texas, but it's very important to Oklahoma. And and for Texas uh, I, I don't think that they believe that they're ready for the SEC just yet anyway. So uh, let's just go ahead and keep playing ball in the in the Big 12 until we think we've got the program where it needs to be. That's my take on it, and I think that I'm – if I'm not accurate, I think I'm close to being accurate. Yeah, I don't think there's any question that has a lot to do with it, and there's some conferences with TV stuff coming up. The Pac-12 needs to figure out what they're going to do with a network that's right. not good. Hey, Tim, uh, I want to get into the tournament. I know you have to – we have to leave at 430 with you, but you sure. mentioned the Northwestern State men's basketball coach, yeah. uh, 23 years there. I, it's interesting. I saw you make a comment. He's a legend. Unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, but I, I had a coach who's a Division One coach who I have a, has been a longtime friend of mine mention that he was a little bit concerned. He had gone up there to see – the retirement, that this happened very quickly and there wasn't a lot of time for former players to come in. Was was this kind of uh, sad the way this went down with his retirement? No, to the contrary. It was okay. anything but. It okay. was anything but. And, and I know because they just got a new athletic director and I had the same questions. So, okay, good. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm very close to the program. Uh, Northwestern State is um, an hour south of Shreveport. Uh, I live at the last exit on I-49, right off that. That's where uh, Southern Trace is located, where I've lived for the last 30 years. So I can get there in 45 to 50 minutes. I almost went to the um, celebratory announcement yesterday, but I couldn't. Um, had a doctor's appointment that I had to make. Um, but I've talked to Mike, and uh, I've known Mike McConaughey since I was in uh, the eighth grade trying to guard him in junior high. And believe me, I couldn't. <laughs> he was, he was, uh, he was a celebrated. I mean, big time celebrated uh, high school recruit out of Airline High School in Bossier City, uh, same school that produced uh, Todd Walker, uh, by example, in baseball, mm -hmm. and played for ten years and had a great career at LSU, a Golden Spikes winner. Um, Mike was uh, recruited by Scotty Robertson. Uh, you might remember that name from the NBA. He was with the Pistons for a number of years. Yep. Also, uh, the Jazz when they were in New Orleans. Uh, Scotty was uh, a high school coach at Bird, which was which our rival school in Shreveport. And he uh, went to Louisiana Tech in 1964. Uh, had a wonderful run there. Uh, Mike went to Louisiana Tech to play for him and became, uh, until Malone came along, I think he was the greatest player Louisiana Tech ever had. Uh, he was the all-time scoring leader. And uh, his father, John McConaughey, was also an all-time great at Northwestern. So uh, he it took him a while to get an opportunity. He coached for 16 years at Bossier Parish Community College and was a consistent uh, winner at that level in junior college, competing for championships against St. Jack and you know all the great teams back in that era between 83 and 99. He got the Northwestern job, got him into the first, uh, what, what is now the first four. It was the uh, play-in game in 2001 against uh, Winthrop, and they won that game and then took on the number one seed that Bill Self had at Illinois that, at that time up in Dayton. Uh, and it was so cool for me to get to, to call a game uh, with Rick Patino. Patino was between jobs. He'd been fired by the Celtics, and he was going to uh, Louisville, as it turned out. And he did the tournament with me that year uh, in Dayton. And uh, so that was the first ever NCAA tournament win, you know, in the big dance for that school. And then he goes back five years later. He had a number of championship teams uh, there at Northwestern. In fact, uh, while Brad Underwood was having that great run at Stephen F. Austin, their chief rival was Northwestern State. I yep. mean, those yep. they, they were unbelievable rivals and played for titles, it seemed, every year. In 06, he got in. 
uh, went up to, to, to Michigan, up into Pontiac, and uh, and beat Iowa. They were the Big Ten champions. They were a third seed and beat them at the buzzer. Uh, Verd and, and Raff did that game. And they almost beat West Virginia to get to the Sweet 16 that year. Uh, and he continued on, got one more visit, which happened to be my last tournament in 2013 in Austin, and they played Florida when he won the Southland Conference again. You know, um, he is the all-time winningest college basketball coach in Louisiana history. Now, that's saying something uh, when you think about, you know, the incredible run Dale Brown had. But sure. Dale's only job was at LSU. Mike was at, uh, at the junior college level competing for national titles, and, and then he went over to the Southland Conference in Northwestern State and uh, was always, uh, you know, in a position to win the, the league outright, but you had to win the tournament to get in, usually a one-bit league, as you know. And, and to get an NCAA tournament win for them was like winning a national title. Um, I think the thing that happened to him, fellas, is, and it's happening in a lot of the small schools, the transfer portal is a real problem for uh, schools that are in one-bid leagues and have very little budget. Uh, schools like Northwestern have to play maybe nine to ten money games outside their league to sustain their athletic program, particularly if they're playing football, which they are uh, at the FCS level. And those are long road trips, you know, and they played a lot of teams in the Big 12, including Oklahoma State, who they beat at gallagher Iba Hall back in 2005. Uh, they were a tough out, but they played, you know, Arkansas. Uh, I think they came over to Baylor a few times, did they not? I'm pretty sure they did. Yeah, I, uh, yeah. They, they, they were, they were on the non-conference schedule. They, they needed those games, like in SFA. You mentioned. And I, by the way, the Nacogdoches and Nacogdoche. I, I went, yeah. to, I went to SFA, so I know all about Chief right. Cato. The big wooden yeah. Indian. So <laughs> that's the biggest trophy. <laughs> that's the biggest trophy in college sports, isn't it? Yes, it is. it is. It is a like a six or eight or ten foot monstrosity <laughs> that sits in the end zone of whoever wins. Tim on the yeah. tournament. Um, we know there's always arguments about maybe someone should be a higher seed with a Tennessee and all that at three instead of two, whatever. In your opinion, is there someone in particular among the top two or three seeds that you feel like? is vulnerable or, or maybe should be early on with upset alert? Yeah, Baylor, uh, I do. I think Baylor is in a, it got a tough draw. I, I think Baylor, now I, I, I don't think that they'll have a problem uh, with the winner of the Marquette Carolina game. But I, I, I've got, I think that's a vulnerable region. And I also think the Midwest where Kansas is, is a vulnerable region. Uh, because there are teams that are just match up nightmares that you have to play. Uh, you guys will see it fairly soon on social media anyway, so I'll tell you, I've got St. Mary's beating UCLA and Baylor in back-to-back -back games. Mm. I, I, St. Mary's is a real problem for a team like Baylor, in my opinion. They handle it well. They've got bigs. You think about them and you say, well, they really don't uh, attack and they, they try to uh, milk the clock and, and keep the game you know, in the 50s, that's really not the case necessarily with them. They've got very skilled offensive players and guys that can handle it all through their lineup. And I think that they're overlooked big time because of the domination in that league that Gonzaga has had for such a long time. Uh, they're a problem. And I think also Purdue is a problem. If I'm wrong about St. Mary's, I, I, I don't think I'm going to be wrong about Purdue. A lot of people have Kentucky coming through that region, as you know. Sure. Um, I think Kentucky's problems with their guards, their 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 uh, their injuries, you know, with Ty Ty and with Wheeler, who have not been healthy for you know really the bulk of the last six weeks of the season, is a problem. If they could go, if they were healthy, then I'd feel differently. And, and you know what? You guys have gone through similar circumstances, yep. as you know, with with uh, with really talented players that haven't been in the lineup for you know on a regular basis that really disrupts your chemistry and uh, it you know I give I give uh, Scott a lot of credit for what he was able to do you know to get this team to a number one seed even with all those issues that he had within his league I just think from a matchup standpoint there are some really dangerous teams and if I happen to be wrong by the way about St Mary's and it happens to be UCLA my God that's a tough out yep uh, They've got maybe the best starting five in college basketball. Now, they don't have much of a bench. You know, they, they lack depth. But, uh, I mean, there are just a lot of teams for them to, to get past. But I ultimately believe 
the team that you have to keep an eye on that's, say, above or below, let's say below a top four seed is Iowa. Hawkeyes are playing better basketball right now than just about anybody in the country. And I think they, along with Wisconsin, are very dangerous teams for Kansas to deal with over in the Midwest. Tim, I know you got to go. I have a question. I brought this up yesterday. I know you have a couple minutes here, and that's it. Yeah. I don't like the fact that I understand who 16 seeds are. For example, tonight right. it's uh, Wright State and uh, Bryant. Mm-hmm. Right. I don't mm-hmm. like that if they win a tournament, I don't care if they're 16 seeds or not, that they have to play a, a, fi- a first four, and then it's – you know what I, I – why not have more all the at-large teams do that who are the, the last at-large to get in the tournament? I understand the size and the power and all that stuff, but yeah, I, yeah. I, don't, I think that's a little bit greasy. Well, let me say this. I've heard this, uh, this said many, many times, and it's a reasonable objection to the way the tournament is handled. When they, you know, they almost, when they wound up going to 68, they almost, I think it was up to 92 maybe, I think that was the number, that they thought about. And then we wouldn't have had all of this, uh, which could be done and, and may be their next move uh, when the television contract's up. But, God, that won't be for another 10 years. That deal's locked up until 2032. Uh, it, going back to Mike McConaughey for just a second. Yes, sir. Uh, that year, they were 16, and they were playing, and there was only one extra. The, the, what happened was there was another team, another conference that had, had become eligible to be NCAA Division One, and they were off a number, so they had to have a play-in game, and they decided to do it in Dayton. And it went well, and Northwestern wound up playing Winthrop, Greg Marshall's team. And you know what? They, they, they won that game. They got first-round money. Now, remember, those schools, schools the size of Bryant oh, yeah. uh, and Wright State and Northwestern, they get first-round win money all right, for playing that game. So going to the next round for them, that is still they're still going to get paid, even though they get knocked out by one seed almost always, right? Uh, until UMBC came along, those schools they love being able to put in their brochure. We went to the NCAA's and we got our first NCAA tournament win. Never mind, it was to just get in the field of sixty-four. Yeah, that's they true. love the money and they love to promote the fact that they got a tournament win, that they tasted victory during March Madness. And I think for those schools from their prism, okay, they love it. They think it's wonderful. Um, but I, I'm with you in the sense that it would really be nice if the committee looked at uh, in the future, let's let's put more at-larges in here and let's have a couple of more of these 12 fives, 11 sixes, right? Guys having to earn their way in as an 11 or a 12 when, like, for instance, a team like Texas A&M and Xavier – get left out wouldn't it be fun if you could go ahead and put them in and just have you know more at larges playing off for an opportunity to get in the field of 64 i'm with you there yeah but for the moment for schools like northwestern state and bryant college and texas southern and uh and uh, the team that they they corpus beat last Christi, night uh, Cor- corpus, corpus yeah. Christi, man that, it means the world to them to say hey we went to the tournament we got a w in Dayton. Yep, that's the 2001. They beat Winthrop and then lost to the number one seed in Illinois, as you mentioned. Tim, yeah. thank you, man. I appreciate you. We we do. Craig, Paul, Smokey, we all appreciate you whenever we can get you on the show. Well, happy to do it. And uh, as the tournament uh, gets going, let's do it again. Yes, sir. I, I've got a lot of time. Yes, I can sir. only play so much golf and chase so many grandbabies. Okay? <laughs> you got I'm it. Here for you. Thank you. Tim, okay. Tim Brando, Fox Sports with us. And uh, at least it seemed like we've had Tim on almost once a month. You know, football season on occasion, even a couple of different times in a row. And so uh, uh, we will jot that down. And maybe after the first weekend or two, we'll be able to get back with him and his thoughts on the tournament. Yeah, and that's a very valid point about being able to say that you got an NCAA tournament win, you know, and put that in Absolutely. your brochure. So, yeah, that's, that's a great point. You know, as much as the uh, – the games might be kind of forgettable or, you know, not even really feeling like they're part of the tournament because last night it did and it didn't, you know, it, it, again, it, it was technically the tournament, but it didn't feel like what it's going to feel like tomorrow. Uh, Cause all of those games are going to feel like, all right, now we're, we've got the tournament underway, but that is a, a great point on his part about being able to, 
to find a way to win a game in the tournament. And then for a lot of those schools that have done that through those play-in games, they wouldn't have those otherwise, uh, most likely. So, yeah, that's a, well, a nod to him on Otherwise, that. they're going to get blown up by yeah. the number one seed almost immediately right. other than uh, Maryland-Baltimore County. When we come back, one of the great Cinderella.